follow Sarah. Tragic to see you like this. You had so much fire in you. Sad, too, that your son will never know how... how much you fought back. How much you resisted. And... despite it all, we have him anyway. Brent, thanks so much for being here. I'm so happy to be here. I caught the pilot for Outcasts a while back when they were promoting it at the South by Southwest Film Festival, and it blew my mind. I thought it was one of the great, one of the best horror show pilots I think I'd ever seen, because it's really hard to make a decent horror movie, let alone a horror television show. It's sort of a dubious distinction, really. Uh, one of the best horror show pilots <laughs> ever made. It, uh, keep subcategorizing it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was 21 minutes and airs at Thursday. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's good, isn't it? It's scary. That's Adam what Wingard, we want. Great director. Really good director. I unfortunately was not in the pilot. I came on in episode two, which is tomorrow night. Starts tomorrow night. You just saw a piece of it, right? I haven't seen that. Uh, looks good though. Huh? What can you tell me about your uh, your character? Uh, well, really nothing. Uh, <laughs> no, I uh, I'm I'm sort of a uh, I'm a mystery for four episodes, something like that. And somewhere in the fifth episode, you start to learn a little bit more about me. In six, you learn more about me than you want to know. Uh, seven, you learn more. Eight, you learn even more. Nine, even more. And so it, it, really, uh, it really grows as the series goes on. Uh, I'm, I'm just sprinkled in the first few episodes just to kind of tease you and make you think, who is this guy? Was that something that you knew when they pitched you that you were going to be teased out this way? Did they tell you more about you than the script sort of let you know? Or did you know as much as really the audience is going to know per episode? It, it's really kind of like that. It was, it was really interesting. I've never worked this way before. Which Really, I was finding out about the character almost at the same time the audience does. Wow. Yeah. How did that help you sort of with your performance, if, if at all? I mean, would you have rather have known what you should be performing towards? I generally like to know more, but I thought, well, let's just go with this. Uh, it's a really great group of people making this thing, and, and I thought, well, all right, yeah, I can do that. And, and it's kind of like improv in a way. So it was, it was fun. I enjoyed it. I want to go uh, way back. It's something that I'm always curious about when somebody has uh, a really iconic character, such as yourself, which you have with Data. You know, you're a uh, young... Please. Thank you. <laughs> I have hardly any memory of that. Uh, <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, you're, you're a young working actor, like what, in New York? Your first role is like an extra on, in Stardust Memories, the, the Woody Allen movie? Pretty much, yeah. Were you at all like a sci-fi horror kind of guy at that point? Uh, not really, no. I, I, I'm not sure I am now even. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I sort of became that, you know? Uh, and, 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 which is fine. It's been really interesting stuff to be in. But no, I was just a theater geek. I was just a guy who, you know, I mainly did theater in New York and got little nibbles in, in films and television. What did you think when you first got cast as Data in, in, in Star Trek? What, were you, what was your initial thought for that? I think I can steal this entire series with this character. <laughs> I, I, really? No. You know what, actually, uh, I, I read the script... Uh, my agent sent it to me. He said, you know, see if there's anything interesting in this. And I really thought what everybody else thought, that nobody can possibly do another Star Trek. Star Trek is legendary. They captured lightning in a bottle. Can you do that twice? I thought, not very likely. But I had a lot of uh, bills to pay, and I thought, I need this job. So uh, I read the script. I said, this uh, android character is kind of interesting. And so that's, that's what I went after. And... Uh, uh, I, I had no idea it was going to turn into what it's turned into. I thought basically we'd do it for a year, I'd pay my bills and move on. And not just a success, but a good show as well. I, I would say that I wasn't really a sci-fi kid growing up or, or necessarily like a, a big Star Trek fan. When I got to college, I had lots of friends who were hanging out... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 
smoking weed and watching Star Trek The Next Generation yeah. all day. Yeah. And I would sit on the couch with them, not partake in any drugs but and I would watch I would watch Star Trek and I was always when I first started watching I was really surprised at how smart and how good it was because I always had this sort of thought of it being as some sort of you know late night sci science fiction show but it was actually really well written really good yeah, show yeah Star Trek is good uh, <laughs> it's you know it's it's thoughtful it, it's about something um, every week and uh, yeah I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of it you know, now, uh, having participated in it, it was a great uh, experience to work on it. There was, a, there was a director on the third episode of the series who said to me, if this goes for seven years, you are going to be so unhappy because wow. your character has no emotions, you're not going to be able to play anything, you're going to be so bored. And I, and I really think it turned out to be just the opposite. I kind of got to do a billion different things, and uh, it, was, it was a really interesting character. Plus, the cast was great to work with. We're all still really good friends. We, were, we became really good friends doing the show. Uh, we had a great leader uh, on the show in himself, you know, who I mean. And, uh, uh, <laughs> that is an amazing Patrick Stewart. Wow. Not many people do it. <laughs> Was that something that you perfected on the set and you would do like behind his back with crew members? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it served me well. How did he take it the first time he heard you do it? Oh, he still doesn't like it. Uh, it's a, <laughs> that doesn't sound like me. I was like, <laughs> Stop laughing. Yeah. <laughs> how long did, uh, so how long did Star Trek end up lasting? We did seven years uh, movies? And, and four movies. Wow. Yeah. And you never, you never tired of it. You never got bored of doing the character of Data. I, oh, hmm. uh, no, not really, not really. I, I think I aged out of it, you know. And I've said this before. I just got to a point where I was too old to do it. Uh, I wish I had been 10, 20 years younger when we started, but I wasn't. Uh, I'd still be doing it, you know, if, if somebody would let me. But, uh, but it really, it, it got to the point where it, it was kind of silly for this old guy to be playing this. I mean, I don't know. They found a way to sort of explain Arnold Schwarzenegger aging as the Terminator in the last Terminator movie. That's great. And, and it was great, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it was like, made no sense at all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hope they make another one. <laughs> Robots don't age, but I don't know. This one does. He just keeps aging. It yeah, well, there's all kinds of excuses for why uh, suddenly I look decrepit, you know, and but... But I think it's best to walk away from it, you know, when, when it's still quasi-believable. When did you realize that you had sort of walked into a role that uh, was and will, would become iconic, that everybody would know and you would really be known for this? This would be your sort of uh, your legacy. Yeah, you know, I still can't wrap my brain around it. I, I still am, am surprised that people recognize me. Uh, I, I don't look that much like the character. I mean, the character was... But the voice, man. When I walked into the green room just now and knew. I said hi to you, your voice, and I was like, oh, Data. <laughs> like, I was, it was like a gust of wind blew me back. Uh, that's appalling, really. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I guess the only thing to do is start talking like this all the time. And, you know, uh, yeah, but it's it, the only, it's a wonderful, you know, it's been a wonderful sort of double-edged sword, really. Uh, and, and one side of that sword being way sweeter than the other. I mean, and, and much more dominant. The, the positive has been fantastic. I'm really pleased to have been a part of something that is like uh, such a giant part of the American tapestry, really. I mean, Star Trek, this is the 50th anniversary of Star Trek this year. And... <laughs> And, and, you know, Star Trek has always been perceived, I think, by people as either being really wonderful or really silly. Uh, and, and, in fact, it's both of those things. It's really serious and important, and it's really silly all at the same time, with people walking around in these ridiculous suits. And, um, but anything that's lasted for 50 years, half a century, you have to kind of go, mm, I think there's something here. And, and there's no sign of it slowing down. Uh, they've got a new movie coming out in August. They have a new series starting on CBS. And um, 
I hope it goes on forever. I think, really, Star Trek is America's great epic, and uh, we'll see what happens. Absolutely. You're also uh, in another upcoming science fiction film, a film coming out this summer, the uh, Independence Day resurgence. Yes. New Independence Day. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Mr. Roland Emmerich returns to blow up more cities. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, I could not be happier. I mean, I'm so excited. To see. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, it's going to be huge, huge, big movie. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to what it. What was it like working with that cast that so many people returning for since, uh, from the, is it 20 years since the last one? 20 years, almost to the day this film opens. Uh, I, coming back was like really like a high school reunion. It was so great to see, uh, for me, to hang out with Jeff Goldblum and Bill Pullman and Vivica Fox and uh, Judd Hirsch and all of these people who were in the original. Uh, it was great. It, and now there's all these young guys who are in it too, Liam Hemsworth and uh, Micah Monroe and really some... There was a reaction to that. Was it, uh, was it Michael Liam? Michael Monroe or? No, it was Liam, I think. Yeah. Uh, woo! Yeah, no, I can't do it. Uh, but, uh, so yeah, it was thrilling to be back and to be back on a set with Roland, most of all, because Roland Emmerich is just, he's the master of this genre, really. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and he has such incredible enthusiasm for it that it's, it's just great to work with him. Now, I have a question for you. This is a question that I think I ask, I'm always curious, and I ask most actors that I ha get to have on this stage who have had an iconic role like you have had with, with Data, and I would ask it of someone like Robert England or anybody else who's had a role that they've been able to hold on to for seven, seven seasons of a TV show and four movies, and people recognize them on the street. Was there ever a period of time where you didn't want to be known as Data, where you felt like you you would have rather run from it and almost not have had that role because it impacted you getting other roles? Well, that was the other side of the uh, sword that I didn't mention, which, uh, y you know what, I'm not sure it's been particularly lim limiting in terms of doing other roles. Clearly, I've done other roles. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I think where the, there's a public person, you know, the only downside for me at all is that uh, I, I don't particularly love it when somebody comes up to me on the street and goes, Data! Uh, you know, because, yes, there is truth in, in that, but um, at the same time, I, I've lived this, this other, you know, I haven't been alive just for seven years, and that's what that, that series was. I have the whole rest of my life that I like being me. And um, I, I love it that people recognize me and are, are you know, were pleased at, at you know what I did with the part or enjoyed it, uh, but at the same time I, I still prefer me to Data, don't you? <laughs> See, I'm begging, begging for the good. Thank you. I I hoped I would get a woo. And you, you have done other roles. I randomly watched The Aviator a couple of weeks ago because it's on Netflix now. Yeah. And if any of you have never seen The Aviator or you didn't like it the first time, go back and rewatch it. It's an incredible it is. masterpiece. Yeah. And you're in it. You have, a great, you have a great part in that movie. What was it like for you after a number of years working on this show, getting in a movie with Martin Scorsese and also like one of his most biggest budgeted movies? I mean, it's like Martin Scorsese having any tool at his disposal. Yeah, on that totally. Well, uh, you know what? Ironically, one of the reasons I'm in that movie with Star Trek is because uh, John Logan, who wrote The Aviator and has written like a zillion other things. Gladiator. Gladiator, Hugo. Spectre, uh, I think Skyfall maybe too. Uh, Skyfall, uh, Penny Dreadful, the series Penny Dreadful, he wrote every word of. He's, he's maybe the greatest screenwriter going today. And, uh, but he also wrote Star Trek Nemesis, our last film. And uh, so we, we got to be really good friends. And uh, then he wrote Aviator, and he said, hey, there's this part in Aviator. Maybe you want to do it. Can you come in and meet Mr. Scorsese? And I was like, oh, boy. And, uh, you know, I mean, Scorsese is a giant. Uh, but He's the direct, I mean, it's him and Spielberg. Those are the two sort of like From our, kitchen, our time, certainly. Yeah, and, uh, the directors that pe whose names people know. Like, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd throw a couple others in there, like Tarantino at yeah. this point. But, um, but uh, so I, I went to meet uh, Martin Scorsese for this part. Uh, it was on, um, on Park Avenue. He has an office, and he had a meeting in his screening room. And 
I was so excited to meet him. And uh, I went in. Uh, I wanted this meeting to go really well because I, I just, you know, I wanted to be in the movie. And I had just watched Gangs of New York, uh, another great film of his, and we talked about that for a while. And then he, uh, I could feel that it, we were wrapping up, and he said, okay, well, I just wanted to meet you. And, and I said, oh, can I ask you a question? And he said, yeah. And I said, uh, what movie do you think you've seen more than any other movie? And he said, well, I guess that would be The Searchers, John Ford movie with John Wayne called The Searchers. And I said, well, ironically, that's the movie I've seen more than any other movie. And I quoted a few things in the movie so he knew I was being legitimate, because it really is. And he said, let me tell you a story about the first time I ever met John Wayne. And I said, okay. And he says... This is the Martin Scorsese experience you want. Totally. And he said, here, you, you be me and I'll be John Wayne. And I said, oh, no, no, let me be John Wayne. And he says, no, 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 you got to be me. Anyway, uh, he tells me the story. I got home. I got a phone call. They said, would you mind doing one scene in the movie? Would that be uh, okay for you to do? And I said, I, I did one scene in Dude, Where's My Car? You know, I'm a, <laughs> yes, of course. And uh, you know. So I got to work with, with Martin Scorsese, which was fantastic. Oddly enough, Dude, Where's My Car was my next quite No. Okay. I, I, was it? <laughs> it usually is. That's, yeah. the, that's the filmography rundown. Exactly. The James Lipton. And then Dude, Where's My Car? Yes. Uh, let's open it up to the audience for questions. Anyone out here have any questions in the audience? Right here? Uh, hi, Brent. I was wondering if you like playing the good guy or the bad guy. Uh, mm, kind of both. Uh, because I've done both. And I, I, I keep doing both. Independence Day, I'm a good guy, and uh, in Outcast, I'm a bad guy, and uh, they're they're both, you know, acting is acting as long as you get to do it, you know. Is there? They say that there's a lot more to savor in playing the bad guy. Well, yeah, because nobody is, you know, a good guy is sort of operates on on one level. He's a good guy. Bad guys, there's always a subtext underneath it that there's a reason why this person is bad. And it kind of gives depth to the role. And so, yeah. Next question. Hey, Brent. Uh, hey. Such a pleasure having you here. Thank uh, you. I know you had some background in theater. So mm -hmm. uh, did that really help you when it came to uh, doing television? And is it something that you want to go back into one day? I definitely want to go back into the theater one day. Definitely want to do another play. Uh, I've done five, six, five Broadway shows, maybe six. I, I can't remember. But four, did someone say? No, no, no. You must have missed it. Well, uh, but I think being in the theater helps any actor. I don't think, uh, I think anyone who wants to be an actor should go into the theater first and, and learn how to act and then make your way into TV and films. Yeah, it's, it was very helpful. What do you mean, uh, learn how to act? What, what about the theater? And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much on the same page as you, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. What the tools of the trade you get in the theater that uh, you could qualify as learning how to act? Well, one thing about it, probably more than anything else, is that you, uh, once the curtain goes up, the show belongs to the actor. And you're on your own, uh, except for the other actors. Uh, and you have to carry it. In film, it, film is the director's medium and, um, and the editor's medium. And a really bad performance can be cut together to look pretty good. Uh, on stage, you can't do that. You either have to have the goods or forget it. And, uh, and I think it gives you confidence when you go, you know, it gives you a, a craft. And so when you go into films and, and television, you have something to fall back on. Next question. Hey, you said earlier that you, something was like improv and that's fun. What do you like about improv? Well, I like the, uh, I like the, the collaboration of it, really, uh, and the creativity of it. You know, you become, you're, you get to be writer and actor. And uh, actually, working with Roland Emmerich on Independence Day is a wonderfully collaborative experience. The scripts come to you, and they're really just a blueprint for what's going to happen. And when you get on the set, then you start working on the scenes. And, and you become as much a writer as, as an actor. And he's very open to that kind of collaboration. So I, I enjoy that. I enjoy the whole process. 
That's interesting to hear because I feel like uh, the process of making something like Independence Day is so much about getting, I mean, it, it's got to, you have to move so quickly, it's so expensive, so much of it is about the special effects, hearing that he's actually in tune with the actors and letting the actors sort of play and figure things out, uh, it must make for a much better sort of blockbuster movie-going filmmaking than most. Well, I think so because, uh, yeah, those films are primarily about what you're seeing. It's a visual film. It's tons of effects, and he is fantastic at that. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, you have to care about the characters a little bit, and, um, and so he, he works on that very seriously. And even though he works fast, we did basically 17-hour days, and uh, I don't know how he does it, but he is exactly the same at the beginning of the day as he is at the end of the day. And he would keep going if uh, somebody didn't say, you have to stop now. Yeah. I think we have time for uh, one more question right here. Um, hi, Brent. Hi. I like Data, but I think I prefer you too. Oh, thank you so uh, much. Fresh Hell. I love that series. Can you tell me how did that start? Uh, Fresh Hell. I, I, it was a web series I did called Fresh Hell. If you haven't seen it, it's got to be there somewhere. Uh, I did, we did about 15 little episodes. And uh, I, I, you know what? I was just uh, wanting to do something myself and create something myself. And so I got together with a couple of really inventive guys, a wonderful writer and a wonderful director, and we created Fresh Hell, which was basically, I play myself, and uh, the world, the bottom has fallen out of my world completely. And everyone in the world hates me uh, for some reason called the incident. And uh, we never quite got far enough to tell you what the incident was, but uh, we did... Uh, we wanted to do another season. I, I wish I was still doing it. I wish I could, I could do that show the rest of my life. I do. If, do you know anybody who's got some money who wants to... Uh, okay, good. You sort of get a Kickstarter going. Well, you know what? I, I, it's interesting. Somebody suggested to me to get a Kickstarter going on it, and I, I really felt... I, this was a project I really loved doing. Why am I asking other people to pay for it? I, I mean, people like you, you know? I mean, if some sponsor wanted to come in and pay for it, that would have been great. But it didn't happen. Brent, I gotta let you go, but Outcast tomorrow night, Cinemax, 10, is it 10 p.m.? Uh, 10, 10 o'clock tomorrow night on Cinemax and uh, every Friday night. Every uh, Friday night. And sprinkle through the week as well, I think. And, it's a uh, really great, really great show. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I, I, I love it. it. They're doing great things with it. And Independence Day Resurgence, when does it come out? Opens uh, the 24th of June. Uh, can't wait, um, and uh, we'll see what happens. Brent, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, thanks for Ricky. Talking to me. Thank you all.